Good morning. We're going to call the Towing and Storage Advisory Board meeting to order. Welcome, everybody. Please silence your cell phones if you haven't already. And welcome, everybody who's listening online. We're going to do the roll call. Joanne Messina, here. Amy Milstead, here. Jimmy Zulke, here. Kyle Jackson is absent. Thomas Griffin, here. Tasha Mora, here. Jeanette Rash, here. James Spears. Here. So we do have a quorum. And uh, I guess we're ready for our training. Sorry, audience. Y'all got to be trained with us for a minute. So. But this will help y'all too. Okay, welcome. Thank you, everybody. It's nice to see you after a, a several month break in our meetings uh, for session, and now we're back. Uh, this is our first meeting after session. So I'm Elizabeth Salinas Stripmatter. I am the Assistant General Counsel who works with the TOW VSF program. And um, every, every periodically, I can't remember if it's every year, every, I think it's every other year, our board has to receive training on the Open Meetings Act, the Administrative Procedures Act, and the Public Information Act. So uh, we do those trainings during the course of these uh, meetings. And so this is an opportunity, I think, for people who've never been exposed to the various things we're going to talk to about to just kind of have a better idea of how government works and why the board has to operate the way it operates. Um, so we, this morning, are going to go on a journey through these three statutes, as I just said. I'm going to try to make it fairly quick, but if I'm talking too fast or if you have questions board, please let me know um, and I'll take those questions as they come up. All right, so today we're going to start with the Open Meetings Act. Um, this is going to be the most comprehensive uh, act that we talk about um, because it impacts so much of what we do. So the Open Meetings Act is basically the statutory authority or, or mandate for us as a government to operate openly and to be transparent to the public. So the Open Meetings Act requires that any meeting of a governmental body be open to the public and that it be preceded by a public notice so that everyone in the community knows that these meetings are taking, pla are taking place and it will also control kind of what we talk about during the meeting. So we'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the key concepts here we're going to talk about first are, of course, the quorum. The quorum is a hot topic. Um, you may have seen some media coverage on the quorum uh, here in the recent past. Uh, but a quorum is a simple majority of the members of an advisory board or a governmental body. And the number of people on our boards is fixed. And so for this particular board, we have nine members, eight of whom are present today. A simple majority in order to have a quorum is five. So as long as we have five people, this board can meet and convene and make decisions. Um, if there were not a quorum, you could technically convene, but you could not make any decisions as a governmental body. Those decisions must have a quorum in order for them to be considered legal under the Open Meetings Act. So uh, a governmental body includes an advisory board or a committee. Some of our advisory boards have committees that meet periodically to discuss various business. Um, so that is included. Um, and in order to take any official action, as I said, all members of your quorum must be there. Um, and if they are not there, then it would be up to the chair to decide whether to even convene the meeting or whether to say, no, we're not going to be able to convene anything. For example, uh, two weeks ago or last week, we had a meeting of our polygraph board and a quorum of members was not present for that board. The chair of that board decided to go ahead and convene for purposes of being able to receive public comment, which there were none, and for purposes of being able to have the training. Um, but that board was not able to actually conduct any official business, and they had to set aside anything that was on the agenda that would have required an official action by the board. They had to set that aside until the next meeting. So that is a quorum, and, and quorum is one of the key concepts of the Open Meetings Act. Um, another question that people often have is, well, what do you mean by any time there's a discussion or a deliberation that there needs to be, we need to follow the Open Meeting Act? What is a discussion? What is a deliberation? So it's very simple. It's a literally, a deliberation is literally a discussion between members 
between a quorum of the governmental body um, amongst themselves or between a quorum of the governmental body and another person. Um, and they have to be discussing any issue that's within their jurisdiction. So if this board was meeting to discuss adoption of a rule and they were outside of, an op of a po properly noticed open meeting, potentially that is problematic. But here today we have a properly noticed public meeting. We're going to be talking about some rules and so they can take official action and discuss the, the rules and have a, a, I think we're going to have a very robust discussion on those rules during, during our meeting today. Um, and so what is a meeting? Well, a meeting is any time they're together in a quorum talking. That's all it is. But they have to be talking again about issues over which they have supervision or control or they have to be taking formal action. So we're going to remember that because we're going to get to that in a minute. I'm going to give an example of when, where, where you can sort of distinguish between an open meeting and just a, com a social conversation. What is notice under the Open Meetings Act? Notice is when we give the time, the date, the place, and the subject of a meeting that it's held. And part of our notice requirements are that we have to create an agenda and that agenda has to be filed with the Secretary of State at least seven days prior to the meeting and it must be posted online by both TDLR and the Secretary of State. And one thing that's really important I think that the general public may not fully understand is unless something appears on the agenda it cannot be talked about during the course of a publicly noticed meeting. So we can receive public comments, but the board members cannot comment on those public comments unless that is on our agenda. So that is something that I think surprises a lot of people. They'll come to our meetings and they'll want to speak and that's perfectly fine. They get the opportunity to do that. But if the board wants to take up discussions about those comments, that has to be taken up in another meeting that's properly noticed and it has to be placed on the agenda. Okay, so let's talk about social functions, conventions, and workshops because that's where we often get the most questions and I know that you guys in particular do attend a lot of conventions and so this is probably something that comes up uh, fairly frequently for some of you. So keep in mind that a meeting occurs whenever there is a quorum of a governmental body that engages in a discussion about an issue within their jurisdiction. Can members ever meet in an informal setting without violating the Open Meetings Act? The answer is yes. You're free to engage in conversation that's incidental to the event. What you are not free to do is if a quorum of members is present, you cannot engage in you cannot engage with the members in a discussion about board or committee businesses, business or take formal action. So I just want to stop there. Do you guys have any questions about that? Because I know sometimes this may come up if you're at conventions together. Do you, are you fairly comfortable with the concept of incidental conversations? Okay, great. All right. So the key points for us to remember are Always be aware of any situation that's occurring outside of a properly noticed meeting in which a quorum of members are present. Don't engage in substantive conversations relating to board or committee business or policy when a quorum is present if you are outside of a properly noticed meeting. One thing that always um, raises some questions that we get as general counsels is what is a walking quorum? A walking quorum occurs when there is fewer than a quorum of members to engage in, that engage in a discussion about official business and then you communicate those discussions to other members of the board. So for example, let's say we have three people talking about a particular rule that is going to be coming up before the board. If those three people have that discussion and then they go and communicate it to a fourth and a fifth and a sixth and a seventh, you've get engaged in a walking quorum. So you need to be careful when you're having individual discussions with each other. You always need to be mindful of whether a walking quorum is occurring or could possibly occur. You can participate, a quorum of members can participate in initial communication, but subsequent members uh, adding subsequent members to that communication is what we are talking about here. And so that is going to include um, things like having a conversation, memorializing that conversation to an email, and then sending on that email to other members who were not present during the course of your conversation. And we'll get to that in a little bit. So 
Here's an example of a walk-in quorum. On a five-member advisory board, two members exchange phone calls and emails expressing thoughts on an upcoming rule change and exchange research that they have each individually performed regarding the issue. One of the board members subsequently forwards that exchange to another member, so presumptively here um, we're talking about the emails being forwarded. Uh, that's a walk-in quorum if that number of folks constitutes your quorum. Okay, so in the era of technology, you got to be concerned with walking quorums happening during conference calls, video conferences, simple hallway discussions, emails, texts, and other new technologies, which includes social media, posts on social media about official business. Um, and so here are some best practices that we um, advise board members on. Uh, don't meet in small groups to discuss board or committee business and then communicate those discussions to other members. Uh, don't send emails or text messages to a quorum of members regarding official, ad, uh, excuse me, regarding official business, and that's even if you're sending emails to each individual member. So it includes group emails and then sending emails to each individual person. It doesn't matter. It's still going to probably can be considered a walking quorum. Social media, because we live in the age of social media where people have lots of discussions on Twitter and Instagram and Facebook. Um, don't create posts on social media about board business where a likelihood exists that a quorum of members could potentially participate in discussions. Or, and don't ask a quorum of members, even on an individual basis, for feedback on board or committee business outside of a public meeting. This could be considered to be polling. Um, and polling is, is obviously very much of a, a concern. So if you want to talk with each other, just make sure you're following the open meetings guidelines and you are being aware that you cannot get involved in a walk-in quorum. All right, so what are the guidelines that we have for our open meetings or open sessions? As I stated earlier, we can only talk about the specific items that are on the agenda. Um, you can put reasonable limits on public comments and what you'll often see during our commission meetings and during our board meetings is there will be a time limit put on the public who can make comments and that is considered to be reasonable. Um, and, you, and as I said earlier, a member of the public can raise a subject that's not the agenda, we just can't talk about it. However, the board can discuss whether they'd like to place it on a future agenda for more robust discussion. All right. So, what are some of our best practices? We've already talked about limiting your discussions to the specific agenda items. Um, and, and you should also, as a board, try to avoid having these discussions that kind of meander and sort of get sort of off topic of whatever is noticed in your public meeting. So oftentimes that's difficult because we're having really, especially with a board this big, you're having really great conversation, but you have to always have to be mindful of whether that conversation and what, it, what each person is bringing up is within the confines of what has been noticed. If there, you start to wander off, then you've got to come back into what is on that agenda. Um, let's see. And then I've already talked about the other two. All right, so because I'm a lawyer, I have to tell you what the penalties are. <laughs> so obviously, members who knowingly participate in a walking quorum or who knowingly participate in a meeting that is closed to the, to, to the public are subject to possible misdemeanor criminal penalties. Uh, the penalties are a fine of one to $200 um, or confinement in a county jail. Um, or both for up to six months. Okay. Anybody have any questions about the Open Meetings Act? Let me see if I, oh, I did not talk about this one. Civil, so civil remedies, any person who's interested, any interested person, which includes the media, may petition the courts to stop an action that was taken by a board. All right, so that's one of the reasons why following the Open Meetings Act is so incredibly important. Because if you take a vote and you take some kind of action on that vote, if somebody out there says, hey, you violated the Open Meetings Act, then they can go to court and they can say whatever they voted on, whatever action that they voted to take, it's void. And you need to tell them they can't do it. Um, so this kind of here is what we always, as, as attorneys, worry about and why we impress upon you guys like we have to follow the Open Meetings Act because we never want to open ourselves up to 
some kind of assertion that whatever we did was beyond the bounds of the Open Meetings Act and therefore whatever act you took um, is not an official act and needs to be voided out. Okay, so no questions, right? All right, so let me move on to the, these are some resources. If you'd like a copy of these resources, please contact me and I'm happy to email them out to you. The APA, or the Administrative Procedures Act. So the APA, there's a lot of legal words here. I'm gonna break it down. What the APA does is it tells us, and it tells licensees how we put statutes into daily practice. And it tells us about the internal working of our agency and the rules that we have to follow as state employees in the running of our programs. So look at it this way. Your rules reflect our statutory authority. So the rules tell our licensees and guide our licensees on what they can and can't do or what they must do. All right, so a rule is a statement made by a state agency that implements, interprets, or prescribes law or policy or describes the procedure or practice requirements of a state agency. A rule includes the amendment of a, uh, or repeal of a prior rule and as I said, it does not solely relate to the internal workings of the agency. It relates to both the internal workings of the agency and the practical application of our statutes as they apply to licensees. So in y'all's case, VSF has rules that reflect statute and TOE has rules that reflect statute. Okay. Just give me a second here. All right, so what are our sources for rulemaking? You're gonna see here today one of those sources which is legislative changes. So every two years, our state legislature goes into session and they pass a bunch of new laws, and then all the state agencies have to go back and say, okay, what bills impact our programs and what rules do we need to make to accurately reflect the changes in the laws? So legislative changes. We can also get changes through advisory board work groups. You're gonna see that here today as well. We're gonna be talking about the penalty matrix today and that penalty matrix, uh, changes or amendments that are being proposed are the product of a work group that was appointed by the board. Um, advisory board discussions can also be a source for rulemaking. Uh, TDLR staff, myself and others that work within the agency um, may notice a pattern of a problem or an issue that keeps <coughs> coming up or even a question uh, and we may say mm, maybe we need to make a rule that clarifies this or a rule um, that is more of a guidance for our folks, for our licensees. Four-year rule review, all of our programs have to go through the four-year rule review, so every four years there will be a big review of all of the rules within the program. Um, sometimes those four-year rule reviews result in rule changes, and sometimes they don't. It's just kind of a general review of all the rules to look for what changes need to be made, are there any, and if so, then we go through the rulemaking process. Or a rule petition. Um, you may actually see that sometimes during our meetings, members of the public will come up and they will say, I'd like to petition for a change in the rules and they will explain why. Those can sometimes be the sources for rulemaking. Okay, so any interested person may submit a petition to a state agency requesting the adoption of a rule. And so who is any interested person? You must be a Texas resident. You must have, or a business entity located in Texas. You can also be a governmental subdivision in Texas or a public or private organization that is not a state agency, but that is located in Texas. So if somebody wanted, somebody from Alaska wanted to come up and say, hey, I'd like to propose a change to the rule, we would look at this and say, mm, well, you're not considered an interested person under the state of Texas's uh, statute, and so we don't need to consider that. But if a Texas resident comes forward, then certainly that would be a fair request for a rule petition. This is just a handy dandy flow chart for how this all happens. And as you can see, this is a, this rulemaking process, you all know, is very detailed and it's very time consuming. But here is a, a nice flow chart that kind of describes what happens. And we're gonna see this when we talk about our rules today. So you're going from the idea for the rule, you go through drafting, which happens internally. The drafting of the rules is sent to your advisory board, here today you're gonna to see that, for consideration. If they say yes, we're okay with those rules, or no, we wanna make some changes, and these are the changes, we discuss those changes, 
and then, and then somebody will make a motion of whether to file those rules with the Texas Register. This is a really important section of what happens in the rulemaking process because this is the public's opportunity to comment and have their voice heard. So once those rules are filed and published by the Texas Register, then the public then has 30 days to comment on those rules. I will, or another GC, depending on the program, will review the comments and recommend any rule changes to the draft. We will come back to the advisory board. We will talk about the comments. We will make any recommendation and decide whether we want to make a recommendation to the commission. So what a lot of people don't understand is, yes, a board, one of our boards, <coughs> can s publish the rule and say we want the rule but then we still have to go to the commission because the commission is the ultimate decision maker so once the board says Elizabeth we're gonna vote and we have voted to send those rules to the commission then what happens is we go to the commission uh, the commission reviews it um, they we talk to them about whether there are any comments or whether there are any concerns there may be a pretty robust discussion on the rules or not the adoption is filed with the Texas Register and then the rule becomes effective 20 days after the filing. So that's just kind of a really snapshot of what happens but obviously there's a lot of time that goes into here and there's a lot of timelines that we have to hit in order to make all of this happen. Um, the rule review process is, is the same that I just talked about. The program's on a four-year rule schedule. We publish a notice of intent to review. There's 30 days to comment. Um, the GC reviews the comments and makes recommendations to the commission. The commission will decide whether they just want to go ahead and readopt the rules. And then I don't, I've been here for almost three years. I've never seen a, uh, a, the commission not readopt the rules. I think it's rare. It does happen, but it's rare. Okay. So that was on the APA, the Administrative Procedures Act. Any questions on that? Okay, good. So we'll move on to the PIA, the Public Information Act. This is one where we get a lot of questions about it. Okay, so the PIA is the act that controls the release of government records and the public's right to see those records. So um, it's intended to allow every person who has information about the affairs of the allow each person information about the affairs of the government and the official acts of public officials employees. So what does that mean? That means the public has the right to see what we're doing as a government agency. And how they exercise that right most often is by submitting an open records request via the Public Information Act. Okay? So the act makes all documents, records, and other information relating to official business open to the public. However, there are some exceptions. So what happens is when we get an open records request pursuant to the Public Information Act, we pull those records together. We have a whole um, unit division that works on open records. And I'm going to point out Mia Settle. She's back here with her hand raised. Mia is our open records expert. She's our open, open records attorney. So if you ever have any questions, Mia Settle is the one who can assist in those questions. But what Mia's group does is they get those requests and they look at them and they say, okay, we're going to pull these records. What in these records is confidential by law and what are we required to redact? Redaction is simply when they basically take out information that is confidential. So you'll see black marks or you'll see just white out. Um, that is what happens as we go through the open records process. Okay, so one thing to remember is public information includes any electronic information created, transmitted, received, or maintained on any device if it is in connection with official business. This is really, really important. Okay, and the reason why that's really important, excuse me, is because any device if it is connection with official business it does not have to be a government issued device so you have to be very careful when you're on your personal phone conducting official business um, it might open you up to having to produce the the transmittal of the information that occurred on a phone <coughs> so what we always ask people is if you get a request that you can reasonably construe to be an open records request and they don't have to use the words I'm making an open records request if you look at it somebody sends you an email and you're like I think they're asking for TDLR records then immediately forward that on to Mia's group our open records group and let your general counsel me know that you've received that request we will then intake it and Mia's group will work on getting a prompt response which is approximately 10 days we cannot ever ask somebody why they want those records. 
Okay, that would be a violation of the Public Information Act. We can ask for clarifications. And so if you get something that you construe to be an open records request, the best practice would be just forward it on to NIA's group, the open records folks, so that they can ask for any clarifications. They know how to word those clarifications and it just it's just a better practice to have them handle it rather than say, wait, I'm not quite sure. Are you asking me for this? Are you asking me for that? NIA's group will be able to do that um, more effectively. Okay, and so what are some of our exceptions to disclosure that I just talked about? Some of the information that would be confidential that the public would not have an automatic right to see includes dates of birth, email address, certain education documents, and any HIPAA information or Texas medical records uh, that are covered by the Texas Medical Records Privacy Act. So HIPAA is, of course, the Health Insurance uh, Portability and Accountability Act. Uh, and that sweeps up all of the medical records. Not really, I don't think, an issue so much in TOW VSF, but it is an issue in some of our programs. These are some of the resources. If you'd like to see them, feel free to email me. I'm happy to send you those resources so you can, you can look and see where we get all of this information. And that is all for me on this subject. I'm going to close this up. Do you all have any more questions? No? Okay. Well, thank you for your time. And I just wanted to mention, I know one member is missing. Uh, he can watch this video when it's put up online, and that will fulfill his required attendance. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Mm -hmm. The next item on our agenda is um, <coughs> approval of the minutes from the, our November 14, 2018 meeting. Did everybody have a chance to review those? Are there any changes or corrections? Do I have a motion to approve as presented? I'll make a motion to approve. Do I have a second? I'll second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. Minutes are approved as presented. And now we go to public comment. If anybody in the audience wants to make a public comment, please be free. Be sure and pick up a public comment form and turn it in. Right now, I only have one. So, uh, Robert Marcotte, you are up for public comment. And we usually limit it to three minutes. Can you hear me okay? I can. I don't know if they can hear you in the back. All right. Can you hear? Okay. Yeah, they said yes. I'm Robert Marcotte. I'm a private citizen from Arlington, Texas. Um, <clears throat> I'm concerned with uh, a section or portion of the section 8510, 85.710 release of vehicles. A little bit of background why I'm here. October 7th of last year, my wife was stopped at a traffic light in Arlington, Texas. She was subsequently rear-ended doing major damage to her vehicle. The um, police were called. They did respond. Again, luckily, no, no injuries, but major damage. The police investigated. The other driver did not speak English, had no driver's license, no insurance, and the address that he provided to the police was incomplete. So there's no possibility of any further um, pursuit of civil liability. The other vehicle was not registered to this driver. The registration was out of date and the state inspection was out of date by over eight months. Later when I was trying to check on the status of things, I called the VSF and I found out to my surprise that that vehicle had already, within a couple of hours, been released back to this same driver without showing any license and without showing any proof of insurance. Back on the roads. How can this be? It just didn't sound right, didn't seem right. Well, I was told by the VSF that they must comply with TDLR rules. And the rule was satisfied because this individual presented a passport, which was a government-issued picture ID, and a bill of sale. Never registered the vehicle, but he had a bill of sale. Anyway, he was released, he got the car, and he was back on the roads within a couple hours, again, 
no license, no insurance, back on the public roads with you and me and our families. Again, somehow this just didn't seem right. But it turns out the rule as it's written only requires three things to get your car out. Pay your bill, have a government issued picture ID, and show identification that you have ownership or authority to be uh, possessing this vehicle. Even the, the act under 3I where it mentions the insurance card only mentions it in passing, only as an optional form of identification, not as a requirement to be back on the roads driving that vehicle. Madam Chair, three minutes are up. Okay, could you wrap it up please? Yes. Please, my appeal to you is, I know you've got a busy schedule, make protecting the citizens of Texas one of your top priorities. I have given to Anna a uh, document that shows the current rule and my proposed or requested changes to the rule to fix this concern. Thank you. Thank you for taking your time to come up here and speak to us. We really appreciate it. Okay, is there any other public comment today? Nobody else? I have a question of Elizabeth since we just went over this rulemaking. Just a yes. question, Elizabeth. If a citizen, such as this situation, wanted to petition, could he petition since he's a citizen? Yes, no? Yes, under the statute, yes. And But any discussion about that would need to take place in the next meeting and it has to be placed on the agenda. It was only referenced in what you, uh -huh. your presentation. Yes, he so can petition. Happened. Um, but discussions need to happen sure. on a properly noticed okay, meeting. Cool. Uh huh. Just a question. Thank you. Okay. The next item on our agenda are the staff reports. We've got licensing division at first. Good morning. Good morning, board members. My name is Laura Hernandez with the licensing department. Um, I submitted um, some statistics for the towing vehicle storage facility. Uh, companies, employees. Um, I just wanted to kind of go over a, a couple of changes to the staff report, and that is because of some questions from the last meeting in regards to some of the differences in the population and the um, statistics that were provided for the previous years and current statistics. Um, one of the first things is that I did, we did remove the boot company, boot operators, tow trainees, dual, um, because since those stopped regulating, we no longer keep or have that information going forward after they were deregulated. Um, some of the new things was, um, so we put the tow trucks, the tow companies, um, on the first page at the bottom, the active tow company and tow truck population numbers. That was what there was a question of um, in the last meeting in regards to those total numbers to the other numbers for the actual population for the end of the quarters, the years. So um, our uh, deputy director, um, mentioned last time, this is just kind of a snapshot. This is only showing uh, companies that are active. There are several different types of uh, certificate statuses. And on um, the last page <coughs> of the statistics, I've kind of broken down some of them, some of the ones that are the most common, showing that those numbers are different because the statuses can be active they can be pending review, they can be pending, insurance not applied, transitional. And those different statuses could be that there's no insurance. There could be insurance today, but our tool system is updated hourly, minute by minute. So just because the insurance wasn't applied, you know, it, at 12.01 it expired, doesn't mean that the insurance company can't go at noon the next day and apply it. But this snapshot doesn't capture that. It only captures the ones that actually say active. Um, so there's not a way for the system to just encompass every eligible tow company that's part of the population because of the different statuses. So we just wanted to provide a breakdown of, you know, there were like for as of 712, there were 4,000 active, but there were also 99 pending, 99 pending review. And that doesn't mean that they didn't go active the next day or later on that day. Um, and so that's why these numbers differentiate because the system is just updating just 
hourly, you know, minute by minute. Okay. So we just kind of wanted to provide that further information to okay. show why there's a difference in the numbers okay. that, um, for the at the end of the quarters and plus what's current. Right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Any questions? Has? Madam Chair, I just wanted to talk about an observation that I have. We haven't tracked our industry for a long time. Mm -hmm. That we're really, we fell under the average of three tow trucks for a tow company, which is very unusual. And I would, you know, I appreciate how thorough your numbers are because mm -hmm. that gives us a good picture of. Um, to try to figure out what's going on within the industry. Mm -hmm. I think all of us that are in the towing business are concerned about the cost of insurance mm -hmm. and the risk now associated with distracted drivers. So we're really being careful to follow those numbers of the impact that it's having mm -hmm. on the industry. Also, the fact that the average or VSF employees is less than two made that change if y'all will remember to where if you have a, a tow operator's license you don't have to have a VSF employee license too but that's really a very small number and it was a surprise to me so again I really appreciate your thoroughness because mm -hmm. that really gives us a really in the weeds look at what the industry's doing and something that we can possibly and I'm looking for Todd Forrester pay a little bit more attention to in that you know, when going out in the industry and all of the actual numbers and the impact that uh, the economy and the industry is having. One of the things is, is that the whole coast took a hit in Hurricane Harvey. And I just wonder if that's not an impact because it's, it's not been a long time if you got hit, you know. So just looking at the numbers really gives us a good view of what's going on in the industry. Thank you for that. Mm -hmm. You're welcome. Anyone else have anything from Laura? Thank you, Laura. Thanks. Next up is customer service. Good morning. Good morning, advisory board members. My name is Tuan Nguyen. I'm the manager for this program for customer service. Uh, since the last time we met, um, stats have risen quite a bit for the spring. Um, it peaked a little bit in May. Um, Maybe a little louder, please. Sorry. <laughs> so since the last time we met, we've seen a small spike in numbers for the spring of this year. And roughly, definitely during May, we had about 2,500 calls. But our average for this whole fiscal year roughly is 2,000 contacts per month. A lot of our calls is still pertaining to um, licensees and constituents. Um, licensees mainly calling in about um, renewals, tow companies asking about how to add and remove trucks, and then of course printing cap cards. And then constituents when they're in incidents where they went through a towing um, incident with one of our operators or they would just gotten an accident and they are at the BSF and they're trying to see how they can get their vehicle out. But that is definitely the bulk of our calls. Um, other than that, I'll be happy to answer any questions you have. Have any questions, comments? Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. Next up is Enforcement Division. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Michael Shark. I'm one of the prosecutors with the TOE VSF program. I'm going to cover a lot of information. Can you all hear him in the back? Seems like everybody's talking so softly this morning. <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, I won't, I won't do that. I've never had that problem. Uh, board members, thank you for taking the time to come here. And I've, the, the cases I've picked out for review, I mean, you know what we do in enforcement. We investigate alleged violations of the TOW and VSF Act. And then if there's a violation, we seek to impose administrative penalties, sanctions against the license, or work out agreed orders. Um, to try to bring people into compliance and show the industry that, that compliance is our aim. So these cases I've picked out show a little bit more, I hope, than simply what we do in terms of assessing penalties and prosecuting cases. And I'll, I'll point out what I think is interesting in these cases. The first one is Aero Martinez, DBA Fusion. There were some pretty standard administrative penalties imposed. 
what this case I wanted you to know about one of our, our processes here is that when a penalty has not been paid by a respondent after it's been assessed, uh, we refer the the case over to the Office of the Attorney General for collection purposes. We first send a demand letter out and then we refer it to the Office of the Attorney General. Oftentimes, if the license is still in place, we will take further administrative action to revoke the license because the failure to pay an agreed order or an order of the commission is a Class G violation which warrants suspension. And I know sometimes we look at our stats about how much in penalties we've assessed and how much we've collected. And I wanted you just to know about this process that we use as advisory board members. Uh, the second case is one in which dishonesty was used in obtaining a vehicle owner's consent to transfer a vehicle from a licensed VSF to a unregulated body shop. This is, of course, what we've come to call flipping in the industry. Um, the respondent in this case accepted a $4,000 administrative penalty as well as a revocation of the storage facility license to be probated for three years. We found that the, the probated revocation or suspension of a license is a really an excellent tool to show um, our licensees that they can operate in compliance with the law and still make an honest dollar. Um, oftentimes we find that after a probated period of time, those uh, businesses become model businesses because they've changed some of their ingrained and systematic business, um, business practices and now know the rules because they've taken them seriously under the threat of um, suspension or revocation under that probationary period. In this case, the penalty and the restitution to the insurance company were paid. Uh, the next case is a criminal conviction case. I wanted you to understand this process that the respondent who was consent, consent tow truck driver was imprisoned in a penitentiary due to a felony conviction. Um, our enabling act, that is chapter 51 of the Texas Occupation Code, states that an occupational license must be revoked upon imprisonment following a conviction, felony conviction, felony community uh, revocation, or revocation of parole. So in this case, the, the license was revoked. If a person does serve time for one of these convictions or violations, that doesn't mean they're permanently ineligible. So a tow truck driver, a VSF employee, can always reapply for a license uh, one year after the anniversary of the revocation. And so what we're trying to do is protect the public from people who've shown criminal propensities without taking their ability to earn a living away. And that's a number of the cases we have is people coming and saying, I've paid my dues, I've shown that I'm, I'm capable to work safely in a field that involves public engagement, oftentimes in dark and shady places, and I'd like my license back. And it's something the commission really takes seriously is ensuring that people are able to continue in their line of work after um, their time in jail or penitentiary. The following case, Claude Woodward, um, this was a suspension for failure to pay administrative penalties. Even though the license, the tow license was suspended for failure to pay a penalty arising from an earlier infraction, he continued <coughs> to tow and so we assessed a $4,000 administrative penalty against him. I think what's interesting in this case is again one of the tools that we have in tow VSF as well as other programs which is for the executive director to issue a cease and desist order. Staff can prepare one where there's a threat that a person might continue to engage in the, the business even though they're no longer licensed. And it's a very important tool that we have is the issuance of a cease and desist. They've been effective. If we find that the person continues to operate after the issuance by the executive director upon the request of staff for a cease and desist order, we will go in and seek a, a, an attorney general, an, an assistant attorney general to come and obtain an injunction against the individual, which we've done a couple of times in the tow VSF. Christian Leon is another flip case and you know flipping the way we define flipping is the use of fraud, dishonesty and deceptive practices by a tow truck driver or by a VSF employee to take an incident management tow which of course should go to a VSF directly to an unregulated body shop or transfer it from a vehicle storage facility to an unregulated body shop. The law says, of course, a consumer can choose wherever they want to take their vehicle, but an accident scene when the tow truck driver pulls out an authorization of release, a power of attorney, a subrogation, an indemnification agreement for a person at an accident scene to sign because they say, 
you know, at a VSF, you, you're not going to be able to get this done. I've got a sweet body shop. That's one of the grossest and rankest forms of fraud and deception against our citizens because it's a time of difficulty. So we've been prosecuting those very aggressively, these flip cases. Um, and I would just like to take a moment to introduce Special Agent Roy Leck from Montgomery County Sheriff's Office, Office and Deputy Sheriff Tamara um, um, Simon from Harris County Sheriff's Office. Um, law enforcement has been working with TOW and VSF staff very carefully and closely, both in the investigation and prosecution of these flip cases, which are probably the biggest concern we have at this point. Madam Chair, may I jump mm -hmm. in real fast? Mm -hmm. uh, as everyone knows, I work for the Houston Police Department, and I am in the auto dealer's detail, and we oversee towing and storage in the city of Houston. And I just wanted to, to commend Mr. Shirk and his staff and Mr. Leck back there for the assistance that they've given us, and I want to commend him for all the efforts that he has done in the Houston area and Harris County in helping to eradicate this because it is a huge problem and he's given us valuable training and uh, expert testimony in, in trying to get rid of these bad tow companies in VSF. So I wanted to say thank you on behalf of the Houston Police Department. Thank you, Sergeant. Very good. And Michael, is there any way you could in the future add um, the city of these violations? Of course. I, I think that'd be helpful because um, it seems some of the flipping cases are concentrated in Houston and Harris County. I'm just they are Harris County and Montgomery helpful. County. If you think about it, it'd be helpful. I sure will. Thank you. So, um, Mr. Leon is an IM tow operator. He tricked and deceived a vehicle owner at an accident scene to sign documents authorizing the car to go directly to a unregulated body shop, which was affiliated with his tow company. Uh, rather than going to a VSF. Uh, we charged two counts, failure to take the vehicle to a licensed VSF and obtaining a signature authorizing repairs um, by deceit. Um, we settled this case without the need to go to hearing with a $7,000 administrative penalty and the probated revocation of his IM operator's license for three years. Uh, of course, we've also taken a corollary action against the tow truck company. And this is what we find is that oftentimes the tow, tow truck company, the owner there or the manager, the director, has a body shop right next to the towing company. And this is what makes it especially egregious. So he is right now on a probated <coughs> revocation. He's been making his payments, and the monitoring shows that he's really in compliance with the law. So those are, are some of the interesting cases that we've had um, since your last meeting. We've had lots of little current projects. One of the most important one has been the meeting of the work group to go over the enforcement plan or the penalty matrix. And I'll talk about more, th more about that later. But we met on November 14th with, um, I think, Ms. Rash, Ms. Mora, Ms. Messina was there, and Officer Zilke. Um, at our first meeting, and then we've met a couple times since there. And I'm really excited when we get to that point about the enforcement plan because this is well, it's, it's been needed to be worked on, and the degree of cooperation was just amazing. Um, we've been out in the field trying to educate and serve a public education function and serve as a resource to all sorts of stakeholders. Uh, Inspector David Kotzenruther and I did a six hour training at HPD on January the 11th, uh, 35 officers from auto theft and HPD was generous enough to allow us to invite other people, so we did have officers from Harris County Sheriff's Office, Montgomery County Sheriff's Office, as well as the National Insurance Crime Bureau, who, which has also joined our efforts in addressing the flipping problem in that area. Um, I, was, I was honored to be asked to speak at the convention, the 2019 convention of the Texas Association of Special Investigative Units in Pasadena. Uh, I didn't know what a unit was, I thought it was a person, but the special investigative units are people who have subject matter expertise and they're embedded in like medical fraud units for insurance companies or tow VSF fraud, um, um, housing repair fraud. So these are the people who go in and investigate when the flags of fraud come up in insurance claims. I gave two presentations there um, on flipping and how to identify it when, when it comes through the insurance desk. Amy Davis, local um, reporter from Houston, gave us favorable coverage on April 26 after a case I appeared in front of for the, at the request of the Houston Police Department. And it really was great 
free coverage because she <coughs> after she went back, you know, they do the interviews and then they go back to their desk and they say 30 seconds worth of information. And she perfectly stated the department's position as well as gave a nice overview of what consumers should look for and what they should not do when a tow truck driver approaches them with documents to sign in the field. Um, I've also been, been pleased to be asked to come speak um, to the International Association of Special Investigative Units at their annual convention in Phoenix, Arizona. And the, um, I want to thank our executive director and deputy executive director for authorizing the trip and my travel out there. I think not only is it important to share notes with some of the other jurisdictions that have been dealing with this problem, but the number of, of workshops that are going to be given, I think, are going to be fantastic for me to come back and give trainings to uh, our investigators and prosecutors in what the International Association of Special Investigative Units works on. <coughs> the next area that I want to talk about are the stats. They're on page three. They pretty much speak for themselves. What I'm I'm pleased to say is that we are closing more cases than we're getting in, but that's always a snapshot. As you can see, we opened um, 1384 tow cases. We've resolved 1647. Not so good with the VSF, um, but we are um, holding water in terms of trying to close cases within a 500-day period, within a 60-day uh, uh, period, <coughs> if at all possible. Uh, we have been given metrics that we're expected to conform with in terms of closing cases, moving them on, while at the same time allowing attention to be given to cases that may take a little bit longer. Could you restate that on um, your time period? I got a little confused. You said, I thought you said 500 day and well, a 60 we have, day. Yeah, we have, um, we have what we call 500 day reports. Anytime a case reaches 500 days, oh, that, okay. that okay. shows up in our report. Generally, we um, try to close cases in the area of 300 days. Um, if not faster than that, um, and that's, that's after it comes to our desk. Okay, thank you. The average penalties and are, are seen in the um, lower portion. One of the things that we did with our penalty matrix, which I'll talk about a little bit later, um, here in the concerns from previous advisory boards, our penalties seem to be very high compared to other programs. We've made a wholesale shift of penalties into a lower area to reflect concerns that have been brought to us before. The top 10 disciplinary violations are set out for you. I think one of the interesting numbers is lacks honesty, trustworthiness, integrity is moving its way to the top because that's the primary charge we use when vehicle owners are asked to sign documents under fraud or deceptive circumstances. Um, Signage is still a big one. <coughs> Criminal history, which I talked about a little bit earlier, where licenses are denied or revoked because of criminal history. Um, this, this reporting period, at least, was moving to the top. And then tow without legal, illegal tows are remaining our, our top offender. Uh, excuse me. I'm trying to have a question about that, Mike, Michael. Is that someone who has a license and then they've committed a crime and then upon renewal they come up with a criminal that's addiction? that's some of them yes is okay. people who've committed a crime that would result in <coughs> ineligibility during the term of a license very frequently what we find is people who get licenses because they've lied on their applications you know on the criminal history application it'll say have you ever been convicted of a felony and they put down no and then they say well you know, somebody else completed it for me, or I, I didn't understand the question, or some, one of those lines like that. And so we uh, will bring enforcement action against them as we discover that they've, they've misstated the, the facts on their, their application. That was new, I think. I hadn't seen it. I don't remember it. No, no. But it's, it's, we've had quite a few in the last reporting period. Madam Chair, I, I also have a question as well. So on the list of the top 10 violations, and we have them listed with the number beside them. So for example, without authority, a illegal tow, and there's a number 19. Is that of the number of cases that were, were resolved? So under tow, I see 1,647 cases that have been resolved. And then what I'm also seeing further down is 19 were found um, 
the violation to be without authority. Well, that's correct, but that huge number of resolved cases involves at least, I would say, 70 percent close for insufficient evidence. You know, people um, file complaints, <coughs> especially in tow VSF because they're mad. And, mm -hmm. right. they, and so, yes, we've had 19 cases closed because of illegal tows since the last reporting period. Okay. Thank you. Of course. Does anybody have any questions about the top 10 violations? On the next page, page four, the first statistic you see is failed to timely send or publish. I have a question on that one. <laughs> but I haven't said anything. <laughs> That's new. Though. Let's get ready. That's brand new. What's going on? This is, this is really interesting. Um, <laughs> Texas Department of Motor Vehicles has taken on a program where every time they see an application for salvage or non-repairable application for salvage or non-repairable vehicle titles are submitted to them, right? They want to have transfer <coughs> title transferred from the registered owner to them because of an abandonment. So they go through that process at Department of Motor Vehicle. What they've been doing over the last six to eight months is scrutinizing the first and second notices that go out. So they're filing complaints on They're this filing way? complaints. You're kidding. <laughs> And oftentimes, there's perfectly legitimate reasons why the first or second notice didn't go out, but we're, we're not just, I mean, we then scrutinized their case very carefully to see exactly um, why the first and second notice didn't go out timely or to the right address. Obviously, a lot of times in these abandoned vehicle cases, which most of these are, um, the owner is not properly listed in the registration material, so the notices go to the wrong person or the owner has no interest in the car whatsoever. <laughs> and so even if notice goes out late, like a couple of days generally, uh, no claim is made on the vehicle and then it's sold for salvage. Madam Chairperson, I have a, I have a question. If, do you, do, does the department have any numbers on how many new cases have been opened by the DMV's um, submission of the filing these, uh, these alleged violations or what I don't know how to word it but how many new cases are being generated and open because of the D DMV's new action I, I don't know that raw number I can tell you coming across my desk I'm probably getting one every week um, which is a huge uptake from the past but it's in not the very many considering how many vehicles no. are sold but still, but it, yeah, right. Really, don't need someone else watching what our dates there. Well, it just creates more workload for TDLR as well. well. Documentation is <laughs> enough in itself. To right, all those documents you have to submit. Yeah. Okay. But you know, in the same way that we appreciate working with HPD, HCSO, yeah. MCSO. Um, Maybe when they see there's not that many, they'll feel better about us, <laughs> and they won't feel like they have to. Any other questions on that? With respect to personnel changes, I don't know if you got a chance to um, meet our newest tow prosecutor, Tony Reed, back here. Um, he's been Anytime. he's been jumping on cases pretty quickly. Uh, he has some Navy experience, uh, quite a bit of Navy experience where he came from, um, and it's, it's been nice having another tow attorney to work with. One of our former tow attorneys, Robin Glasner. <laughs> Um, who worked the tow VSF program a couple of years ago has just accepted a position with the Office of the Attorney General, which we're real pleased about, except sorry to have lose that resource because she, she knew quite a bit about this program. But she, now she's working other programs. So it's Tony and I, um, and I think we make a good team in holding down the fort. So if you have questions about the tow law, the VSF law, about what we're doing as staff holding up our end of the deal, um, feel free to call me or Tony. <coughs> He probably knows more than me already. <laughs> and I believe I've run through the statistics already. So unless there are any questions, I'm going to step down until we get to the enforcement plan. Okay. Anything else? Good job on the flipping stuff. That's been uh, 
a thorn in our yeah. side for a long time. Yeah. So it's good. Yeah, good it's that we're finally getting some traction. Well, on what, what we're finding is it's much deeper than we had anticipated. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Michael. See you again in a minute. Education and Examination Division. Good morning, Madam Chair and Board Members. Letty Grantham in Education and Examination Division. And I'm here to present the report today. Uh, and I don't have very much to present other than the statistics in front of you, if you have any questions. Any questions? Thank no? you very much. Okay. I do want to take the time to <coughs> briefly say that staff uh, changes are coming, you know, but uh, one right now is our team lead that has been with us, Kim Wed, for 37 years will be retiring at the end of September, and she's going to be missed. Oh, yeah. And I wanted to mention that. Congratulations on your retirement. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you can't leave, Kim. No. I know you're excited. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Next up, regulatory program management. Good morning. I'm Todd Forrester with the RPM Division, Regulatory Program Management. And we are changing the way we do things internally in hopes of creating more value for the industry uh, and make things a little more efficient for us. We are working on somewhat of an analytics program. We are now tracking every question that comes in to us. And right now we're using a spreadsheet. Um, Tomorrow, I'm getting with Tuan, who was up here earlier, customer service. We're going to be on the same system they're on. Uh, so we can kind of look at all the questions that come in, the ones that come to us. We are looking at that as a way to help with the trainings. So it's great to have these trainings, but there's something, it's the 70-20-10 rule. 70% of what people learn on the job is from watching, or from doing, from doing a job. 20% from watching and 10% from formal trainings. We've been spending the majority of our time on formal trainings. And now we're trying to get the data to help figure out what the industry needs. And I think that data is available. I think it's just something we have to capture. We have a couple of ways to do that, um, recording the information that comes in. We also, I got with uh, Josh Schroeder, who has been extremely helpful in this. He's with our web development team. Um, he has uh, an analytics website where we can see where everybody's clicking on what page on the towing, on all the towing pages, how often that's happening, how long they stay on the website, everything like that. We, we've broken out the compliance manual into little sections. That website's in beta now. But with those combined things, we can see what they're clicking on, if it's what do notification letters need, uh, what what about the paperwork? Like, what does a tow ticket have to have? We can have all that broken down so we can get a better picture of what the industry needs from us. We're also looking at creating business resources uh, for the industry, such as like infographics to show this is the information that has to be on all the paperwork. Um, it's intended to use the information that we can get passively to try to figure out if we do want to do like a vlog or, or a Facebook Live. We can make it about the questions that are coming up. We can make it more pinpointed. <coughs> because doing the trainings are great. They're needed. We're going to keep doing them. But there has to be a more efficient way. Because we're sitting in a room for eight hours. It's a lot of information. <coughs> How much can somebody retain, right? So that's kind of the idea behind all this. Um, some numbers are in here. And you're more than welcome to read it. The, it's, it's a new, new thing. It's, we just started tracking all, all the questions in uh, May. We we're using a spreadsheet. Uh, it really wasn't, it hadn't added that much work, but it is adding definitely value. The other value it's adding is it, we now have a record of everything, all the questions and answers, right? So that if, you know, God forbid, Todd gets promoted, uh, <laughs> the, the person coming, coming up behind me. Was that a hint? <laughs> 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 we don't know this, Todd, but we're not, we told them you can't. I know. I know. 
<laughs> but the person coming up will have a history of, will have the institutional knowledge to go forward so that it's not just lost. It's, that's what we're doing. If you have any questions, uh, let me know. I am looking at doing things like figuring out to, like if we get a bunch of questions, just because a question comes up more doesn't mean it's significant. You can actually run statistics tests to figure out if it's significant. We're looking at doing things like that. We just need more data at this point, and that'll come with time. Any questions? Great. I'm trying to have a comment. <clears throat> five of the ten are signs. On Will the, we ever? Are you referring signs? to the the, viola the violation? The field inspections division. No, I don't think we'll signs. ever. Right. It's, I mean, seriously. And five you know, of the, ten. the compliance manual has helped. It's helped. I fill the industry a lot. Um, there's samples in the back that they could literally print out. Um, I, I, I don't know. I don't know what we need to do about that, Madam Chair. I mean, it's five of ten. I don't know. We, I mean, serious. I mean, I'm afraid to touch it because every time we fix it, it makes <laughs> well, we other people out of compliance. We can't change it. <laughs> right? Every time we changed it too many times, and then. Well, I don't think we're in a spot where we no. need to change it. I think it's something that that. Education Let me think. Yeah. It needs to be its own module, maybe. And it is. It's all broken down into, you know, indoor signs, outdoor pace of playment signs, outdoor signs on the main entrance. It's very specific. And we're also, we have examples. And that website's in beta now. Hopefully, um, we have a little couple things we want to move around. But again, Josh has been, if it hadn't been for Josh with the web development team, he has been absolutely outstanding. He's helped me understand what makes a good website, which has helped me to provide the content to him to make the website. Um, it's really a, a step forward. So I, I, I'm interested to see what the industry thinks about it when it does come active. Is it a separate website or it's just a link? It's, it's going to be, the, so originally on the right hand side, I, we put an industry compliance section. They'll click on that okay. and it'll break it all down. There's also one for consumers. So we're going to see where we can see where the consumers are, are looking mm -hmm. for the, for the okay. tow hearing information, everything like that. Okay. Good morning. My name is Latasha Poland, also with the RPM division. I'm just here to let you guys know the outreach portion of RPM and what we're doing. We are going to be attending the tow show um, in Dallas. We do have uh, training that will cover the law and rules, and it will also provide the, a platform from the industry to ask questions. I heard there's over 200 people registered for that already. Yeah, we heard so. we had to get a bigger room. <laughs> yeah, that's good. That's um, good. Mary Winston, TDLR, I literally almost said my maiden name. I have no idea why. <laughs> I have been married for 23 years and just, sorry, um, just got an IM that they can hear staff, but they can't hear uh, our board. So everybody's. Are we not talking loud enough? I'm not talking loud enough. enough. Not talking loud enough. <laughs> okay. Oh, I know you can fix it. <laughs> okay, can Sorry you hear me that. now? Can you hear me now? So we are going to be at the Toast Show and providing a training, which I, I just found out today. Two hundred something people signed up for. So I'll, we should bring. I'll get ready. Pictures of all the signs to pass out. <laughs> we, right? We, <laughs> we can do that. Yeah, I'm not kidding. We can do that. Yeah. Any other questions? Anything else? Anybody? All Thank right. You. Thank you I'm so much. I'm excited to see the new. Web pages. Yeah, sounds good. Too. Thank you both. Field inspections division is next. I trampled on this report already. <laughs> <laughs> Only if it works. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I just can't believe it's signs. Right. Todd, I got to take a note for that. Hands on the promotion. <laughs> <laughs> good morning, board members. My name is Fernando Reyes. I'm with the Field Inspections Division. I'll be giving our short report this morning. Um, you previously got provided a list of our 10 most common violations. Of course, we did have a comment about five of them being about signage. Just want to add a note that when an inspector goes out, he does do everything he can to educate that licensee, um, gets online with them as well, and provides them examples. Uh, prints them out and says, hey, this is what you need. So we're out there doing education as well with those, those licensees whenever we can. Um, we know it's us. No. <laughs> <laughs> we do. We know. But we if know. there's something we can do more, by all means, you know, we, we can, we'll do and it. And it we'll doesn't go to enforcement most of the time, right? Right. It's just a Right. It's a it. Yeah, it's a Violation. fix it or, you know, call us, you know, before we even get there, call us. Let us know what do you have questions on. So, yeah, we definitely do that. Um, so we're going to recent accomplishments, uh, specifically changes. Uh, tow company and uh, tow truck inspections, they were discontinued as of February 7th of 2019. 
um, if anybody has any questions on that. <coughs> this was more due into the uh, reducing the redundancy of regulatory burdens uh, on the industry, freeing up some time for licensees and inspectors to do other things that are have come to TDLR. Uh, personnel updates. Um, Field inspectors Jack Phillips and Robin Finney accepted positions in, uh, in uh, enforcement as investigators. Um, there was uh, beginning dates of February 19th and May 1st. So congratulations to Jack and Robin. Uh, North Region Manager Joe Carrasco uh, uh, resigned uh, effective May 26th. Uh, we just wish Joe well in his future endeavors. Um, and Ron Garricky was promoted to Region Manager of the North Region uh, with field inspections as well. <coughs> um, we have six uh, inspectors since the last advisory board meeting. Uh, Don Moorfield began January 3rd, DFW area. Uh, George Vega actually returned. Uh, he was out sick, didn't look like he was going to come back, and he actually did come back to us. So we're, we're happy to have him back. Uh, he started in March. Uh, Tom Singleton and Donna Johnson, also in the Houston area, and they started on June 17th. Uh, Twee, uh, Twee Kempner began in Dallas-Fort Worth on July 15th. And we actually have a new one starting August 1st, uh, Miss uh, Sandra Luker. She'll be out of DFW as well. Okay. There was a statistics provided if anybody has any questions on those. And as of the tow truck uh, inspections being discontinued, you'll notice the numbers changed a little bit. Just a little bit. <coughs> any questions, Board? No. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now our favorite part, executive office reports. And we want to welcome Chairman Ares Mendez, a new uh, member yeah. here since our last Former. meeting. You, you no longer chairman, how, how but you're still chairman from? to me. Yeah. We've had a, Mary Winston TDLR, we've had a, a running kind of wager because staff is so used to calling Mike chairman that <laughs> we have to pay into a pool every time somebody calls him chairman so how much do I it's actually ten dollars which okay. <laughs> yeah. you've called me chairman twice so okay. FYI it's a 60 40 split between uh, you got uh, it. the other deputy executive director Carter James and myself so uh, <laughs> we will need that money um, again Mike Iris Mendes I'm the deputy executive director Madam Chair, I appreciate your recognition. It's been a, uh, a transition now, uh, moving on to this side of TDLR and actually being on this side of the table. And some people may not know, At, well, Mike F -F was chairman right. of our TDLR commission. He was, was over a, everything. I was, the, uh, I was a commissioner since 2005 and mm -hmm. served as chair for the agency for five years before coming on staff. Uh, and actually kind of the other running joke is I'm trying to figure out with Brian, who's our executive director, how I can get paid for the 14 years that I was on the <laughs> Exactly. Board. All the so, donated time you gave. Yeah, I keep Which, bringing it up and everybody kind of keeps bypassing it and never says anything about Thank it. you so, for your donated time. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. So, but I'm here to give the executive uh, report. Um, I, I've got on my notes here to figure out what we can do with Todd now. <laughs> <laughs> the self-promotion that he just <laughs> gave us. So, uh, but a couple of quick things. Uh, we have hired a new director of financial services. Uh, Brandy Cortezales is now with the agency and came on board at the end of June. So she's been with us for about a month now. So we do have a new director of financial services. She's been a longtime state employee, previously served as CFO for another state agency. So we're looking for some great things to come out of her and be able to increase uh, the um, numbers that, that we bring to you in, in the agency. So we're looking for a lot of good things from her. As far as uh, legislative update, as you know, we came out of legislative session. We were blowing and going. Uh, we had a great session. Uh, one of the things that came out of that session is that we have now a new human trafficking component that's been added to our agency. So we received 12 FTEs that will be spread out throughout the agency, primarily, see, primarily focusing on human trafficking. Wow. And that is along with the various programs that we have, massage, uh, establishments that we have along with some of the cosmetology programs uh, there's a huge focus being placed through the state on focusing on human trafficking and we're a big part of that so that's been a big part of our component and uh, we will continue to ramp up and get ready for that begin September 1 uh, we also received some monies to create a new licensing system or, or to obtain a new licensing system that will allow us to replace everything into one licensing system for those that don't know, we currently have about eight or nine different, li I can't, I've lost count, um, uh, licensing systems. Every time we take over a new program, they had their own 
licensing program that they use, so we just <coughs> brought it in, brought it in-house and started using it. Well, through the course of our growth, we've managed to obtain a lot of programs. So we're now looking and embarking on um, trying to get one licensing system for the entire agency. We also got five new IT positions that we'll be able to put in that. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's been a, a good add to us. Uh, some of the programs that were brought over to us, of course, were uh, motorcycle ATV education. Uh, goes nicely with our driver's education that we currently do. <coughs> and also motor fuels. Uh, we will now begin to start licensing and regulating all the fuel pumps that you see in the state of Texas. Estimated count of about 400,000 fuel pumps. Uh, and the devices that belong in there. So every time that you see a fuel pump and you'll see a, des a diesel, unleaded, mid, and super, those are four devices that, that exist there and then on the other side now you get, so it keeps adding up. So you look at such as an example as a Bucky's who has several pumps, that's gonna be, uh, you know, we'll have our inspectors going out there and spending three or four days <laughs> trying to do that. So I, they won't do that, but anyway, there's a lot. Uh, so that has now been brought over to us, so we're working with the Department of Ag to bring that over and have that in there. Along with those that I mentioned, the 12 FTEs for uh, human trafficking, along with motorcycle ATV, uh, the few motor fuels and our IT positions, we will be adding approximately about 100 FTEs, wow. so uh, which is great for us. It's going to be some needed help that we that we have needed in the past, uh, but of course now we've got to find a place to put them. Yeah. So we may have to convert this into a uh, office space, um, and we'll just meet out in the foyer <laughs> or something. But uh, so anyway, we're we're looking at that. We're going through it. One of the things I do want to mention to you is that customer service, which we had Twan up here earlier. Our customer service division moved from the downtown location. They're now here at the North Campus. They're up on the second floor. Uh, so that was a big move that we did back in June. And uh, it transitioned nicely. They fit in. And they're now up and running and taking calls. We had a couple of uh, bumps along the way. But uh, I tell you that our customer service division were troopers and continued to take calls and uh, be able to handle all the calls that were coming to them. Um, of course, you've heard from enforcement and uh, field inspections, RPM, e, uh, education, examination, and the list just goes on and on, and you continue to see the work that they do. Uh, I tell you, one of the things that I noticed when I came here was that I knew, and Brian told me this when I came on, he said, you know, you've always known how great our employees are, you're, fi you're about to find out why. And I see that now on a daily basis, the work that they do. And trust me, they're, they're as dedicated to your program as they are to the, the other 39 programs that we have. And I mean, they put a full effort in every single one of them. So I just want you to know that you, we, you're in great hands with them. Uh, one of the things I do want to let you know is that f we had a mention earlier about our website. And uh, Todd had mentioned, or Supervisor Todd, as he wants to call himself, <laughs> um, about the uh, uh, number of websites and being able to use that. So we're using a lot of web analytics to be able to help us begin to start narrowing down some of the questions that are being asked mm -hmm. so that we can focus on those and get those out there. So it begins to do several things. It's immediate access for those that are interested in getting the question answered. And it begins to start reducing the number of calls that come in because we have that out on the web. So we're working on all that. I can tell you that for the last six months, uh, the tow trucks, operators, and vehicle storage facilities website had 129, almost 130,000 page views in a six month time frame. So that's about an average of about a little over 700 per day went out and looked at just that particular <coughs> part of our website. Um, I, I, we can go in, I tell you, 33% were accessed from a desktop, 64% were accessed from a smartphone, and 3% were accessed from a tablet. So if you haven't had the opportunity to meet Josh, I'm telling you, he is he's a rock star in what he can provide for mm -hmm. us. Uh, the top five reasons for visiting the website. We, we can tell this by the clicking. Uh, number one, consumer information. 31,000, a little over 31,000 hits occurred on people just seeking information from a consumer standpoint. The second one was a towing law. Third were VSF rules. Fourth were the forms of, that are out there for towing VSF. And the fifth were towing rules. And so those are the top five reasons that people went out and visited the website. <laughs> Uh, I think as we begin to provide more information and our staff continues to go out and do more education, we're going to begin to really start driving them to the website 
because they can obtain a lot of information out there. Where, uh, as we mentioned earlier, Josh is in the process of totally, or I'm co continuously looking at the website to see how we can increase it and make it a lot, use, a lot more user friendly mm -hmm. to get that information. Now, granted, he's trying to do this because we also have we have 39 programs that we license and regulate, and being able to get that information out there and and having the consumers and the citizens of Texas being able to get to that quickly has been a challenge. And Josh has taken on that challenge, and he's doing a fantastic job. But understand, it's not as easy as it sounds when yeah. you begin, because normally I think maybe two or three clicks, and I give up if I can't find it. Mm -hmm. uh, and Josh has done a really good job of trying to get you there immediately and being able to provide the information. So I think I've got everything in there. Uh, I'm free to take any calls. I mean, I'm sorry, not calls. <laughs> Well, that was wrong. Uh, yeah, you can call Todd. Um, you can answer any questions if you have at this time. Any questions for Mike? <laughs> Madam Chair, this may be, because we have a couple of other probably big items that we need to discuss. This may be a great time to have a break. You beat me to it. I'm okay. ready. I think we're going to take a, uh, let's get back at 25 till, maybe 12 minute break. And we'll reconvene. Thank you.
Item G, discussion and possible recommendation regarding proposed amendments for Chapter 85. So, Elizabeth, would you yes. like to guess? Elizabeth Salinas, Strip Matter, Assistant General Counsel. Again, and I'm asked Todd Forrester to come up uh, in case there are any questions that RPM might answer, and also because he appears to be very popular today. <laughs> <laughs> so, I figure he ups my. Uh, <laughs> My profile. You might get promoted. I might get promoted. <laughs> right. Exactly. That would be a wonderful actually make that happen. No, don't okay. Come on. You're on. All right. Got it. Um, all right. So we are here today to talk about the um, statutory change that was brought about in HB 1140 relating to the vehicle storage facility uh, fees in relation to storage and impoundment. So um, you all have probably had an opportunity to look at that bill in its entirety, but just to <coughs> encapsulate what it does is it gives the uh, board and the commission some wiggle room that we didn't before have 
to adjust the storage and the impoundment fee based on an analysis that um, and, and, a, and a formula that is based off of the Consumer Price Index for Urban Consumers, which is the CPIU. So you'll see reference to the CPIU uh, in both our, our draft rule, I believe, and also your materials, which you should have, which I believe you've received in relation to the packet, the rule packet. Um, before we go into the draft rule, do you have questions about the bill itself and what the bill is doing? No, okay. So this bill actually received two-thirds of a vote, uh, and so it is effective immediately. So we are on uh, quite a bit of a, of a sort of express timeline to get this done, because what the bill does is it says, if we are going to make an adjustment on the storage and impound fees in any odd number year, we have to publish those adjusted fees by November 1. So in order to publish those fees, those adjusted fees by November 1, we have to actually pass a rule and then publish uh, by November 1. Okay, so in order to do that, we had to backtrack our timeline, which means that we are aiming to get this done in front of the commission by October 1 so that we can actually have this done within fiscal year 2019. All right, so the draft of the rule change is going to be in 857.22. That's where we're going to see the rule change that is actually going to be affected by this. And that section of the rules is uh, <laughs> Chapter 85, uh, and it is the responsibilities of licensees, storage fees, and other charges. <clears throat> As you can see by the packet in front of you, we have no change to subsection A, subsection B, or subsection C. Where we see the first change is in subsection D, on the daily storage fee. Now, currently, the daily storage fee, uh, prior to the passage of this rule, couldn't be less than $5 and couldn't be more than $20. So what we have done is we have taken out the language that it can't be less than $5 because that's no longer applicable. Um, $20 for each day or part of a day for storage of a vehicle that is 25 feet or less in length uh, and also you may charge a $35 for each day or part of day for storage of a vehicle that exceeds 25 feet in length, subject to the biennial adjustment as set forth in the Texas Occupations Code 2303.1552B1. All right, so what we're doing in this rule is we're putting into place what the, stat the statutory change to Chapter 2303 as it applies to vehicle storage facilities um, fees. So for 2019, uh, the biennial adjustment, the maximum amount that a BSF may charge for a daily storage fee is as follows. A, vehicle that is 25 feet or less in length, $20.64. B, vehicle that exceeds 25 feet in length, $36.11. Do you have any questions about how that was calculated or why? No, okay. So I did receive a question prior to the start of the meeting about whether we could have whole numbers. So whether it could be $21 instead of $20.64 or $36 instead of $36.11. The answer to that is no because the statute is very specific on the formula that we need to use and it needs to be based on the data from the proceed from the uh, from 2018, the preceding biennium. And so sometimes when you do those calculations, you aren't going to come up with a whole dollar. You're going to come up with the cents. And so um, we don't have the flexibility on that to round up or to round down. That's why we have the cents uh, associated with that. So then, then, then you will see renumbering <coughs> of the next two portions of the rule. Uh, and then the next amendment will be on section E in the impoundment fee. Um, a VSF may charge a vehicle owner or authorized representative an impoundment fee of $20 subject to biennial adjustment as set forth in Texas Occupations Code 2303.1552B1. Per the 2019 biennial adjustment, the maximum amount that a VSF may charge for an impoundment fee is $20.64. Uh, and then it goes on and it, it retains the rest of the rule as it's currently written. If the VSF charges a fee for impoundment, the written bill for services must specify the exact services performed for that fee and the dates that those services were performed. Um, are there any questions about that? Yes. I have a question. Would it be possible to, we've talked about this several times, deleting the um, requirement to specify the exact services? <coughs> That's not in the statute, is it? This would be a good time to 
take that out since we're in this rule? I believe that we're specifying exact services because that's a consumer issue and we, we need the consumers to be aware of exactly what they're paying for. But the, the issue is that the, there's already a, <clears throat> it's a violation if you don't do the services, but writing it down what you did exactly doesn't really help anybody. It's more, the services need to be performed to charge that fee. Mm -hmm. So who, what does it matter if we write it down or not? Why do we have to be penalized for not writing it down if we did the services? That's the philosophy. And um, to me, it's a, a useless rule because it doesn't change the fact that the services have to be done. Right. It only yeah. requires you to write down the exact things, and there's a lot of violations on that that's kind of nitpicky. And it's not a big deal for the people who are automated, mm -hmm. but for the guys who handwrite everything, the little guys, it's very mm -hmm. burdensome. Mm -hmm. And to be penalized for not, even though you did it, but you didn't write it down that you did it, mm -hmm. it doesn't help the consumer that much, I don't think, in my opinion. I don't know how everybody else feels about it, but... Madam Chair, I think it's a good discussion, but I think that there probably are a couple of other rules that we could put on the agenda. I really think that this is more about Oh, this one's been on my list for a couple of years, but it's we're in this rule right now. To me, it, it's let's, if we can take care of it, let's do. If not, we can add it later for more discussion. And so thought. you're correct that we are in the rule, and, and we could, if you wanted to put a motion to do that, we could certainly do that. However, um, I think I'm going to defer to Mike because this goes yeah. to the timing. Right, and understand that. Would that affect our timing if we did that? Changes that we make to the rules at this point in time. I'm sorry, Mike Erisman is Deputy Executive Director. Changes that we make to the rules that are before you right now <coughs> would delay yeah. the uh, timing Oh, the we don't want to do that. Sent okay. to the Texas Register for, okay. For that's fine. I just wanted to put it out there. Yeah. So okay. that's, you know, I'm not saying that we won't address that in the future uh, once we begin to start vetting out a little bit more, but uh, I think for purposes of timing, the rules that are before you are the ones that we probably need to move forward with and any minor changes, you know, okay. uh, maybe just take okay corrections or something like that. It's been on my list for a long time, so we'll get it. Sure. <laughs> and you know, we'll continue to have discussions about right. various rules that need to be updated. We're always looking to try to go in and and of course, you know, because I've told you for the past couple of years, I'm on the crusade to try to stop repeating what's in the statute, in mm -hmm. our rules. Um, so, we, you know, TOW VSF is one of those programs where the rules are constantly evolving and changing, and we can certainly come back to that on another issue. Um, but yes, delaying this, I don't think, would be in the industry's best interest. Mm -hmm. Madam Chair, uh, thank you for your understanding. Oh, yes, no thank you. Uh, and remind us that that's something you want to come back to, please. Yes. <laughs> okay. Elizabeth, I would like to just kind of lay a little path, if that's okay, here for everybody that's listening, be it consumer or the industry. Um, rates for VSF have been in statute since originally 1980, only one, adjusted one time in 2005. And I don't want the industry to be uh, taken back by that it's a small amount because this is a long-term project that will benefit the industry in the long haul. So don't be discouraged about that. And at the same hand, it's fair to the public because we've always been very specific about rules and what you can charge and the duties that have to be performed in order to charge. So we never dreamed that that would not, that we would be stuck basically in neutral for basically 30 years. Sure. So this is just a mini step forward, but it is a step forward. I don't want the industry to get discouraged, but I want them to understand this is a long-term project that will help them mm -hmm. as we move along and at the same hand be, be very conscious of what the public pays for our services at the same time. I and you've actually reminded that. me of something that I forgot to say when I was talking about HB 1140. And one of the things that HB 1140 does is it allows for, in every odd number year, this consideration of an increase or a decrease. And so in instances where there might be a decrease in any given odd numbered year based on the preceding uh, financials from the preceding year, you could decide we don't want to go down, we don't want to increase. You could decide that you want to hold at the current 
level of whatever that level is in any given odd numbered year. So you're absolutely correct that this this gives some discretion for the review of these fees every other year in every odd numbered year, whereas before there was nothing in statute that allowed for those reviews to occur on a set schedule. And so you had this long gap where there wasn't discussion about it. So this gives you all the flexibility um, that you did not have before to sort of make these decisions <coughs> of how you can best address uh, costs uh, within the confines of this, the, the ability to adjust up or down the storage and the impoundment fees. Thank you. Okay. Um, so what the other thing that HB 1140 does is it strikes out the existence <coughs> of the environmental fee. Um, and those of you who've been on the board for for really the past uh, couple of years know that th that has been an ongoing discussion about the setting of the environmental fee and sort of the struggles that we've had getting any data that would allow us to set that fee. So this bill um, undoes, undoes, excuse me, the environmental fee and strikes it out. So that's why you see in subsection G we have stricken it out of the rule entirely because it no longer exists. Are there any questions about that? Okay. so. Madam Chair, would you like to then lead a discussion with the board on what they'd <coughs> Any discussion? like to do? I just want to say how much I appreciate the department really getting after this and, and trying to get it in place because <coughs> it's been a long time coming. And like I said, I want the industry to be encouraged that we hear you, we know our industry's been through a lot in the last couple of years, which we do. Uh, we're taking on a bigger load in incident management and, and dealing with a lot of risk now that that is much more than used to be. So I really appreciate the department helping us. I do. Sure. Well, we want to make sure that we get our rule timely done so that you all can have this uh, and be able to roll it out to the industry, assuming that we don't have any further <coughs> delays, of course, because you know this is just the first step. Um, and after you make your decisions here today, if you decide to um, move to publish, then of course it goes into public comment. Any more discussion? Comments? Do I have a motion to um, approve? I make the draft a motion rules? that we approve. Do I have a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Okay, let's move it on down the road. Thank you. Thank you, Elizabeth. Okay, our next item for discussion is the <coughs> updates to the penalty matrix that, uh, where'd Michael go? The work group met on this and the work group <laughs> was Tasha Mora, Jeanette Rash, Jimmy Zolke, and myself. And we went through every violation and looked at it to see how we could make it, um, make the penalties more appropriate and put the violations in a more appropriate spot. We did go from A, B, C, D, <laughs> seven classes, is that right? Mm -hmm. Down to four. That's correct. So. I apologize for coming in late. I um, had to call up my Meals on Wheels delivery person because I told them I was not going to be able to make it. I had really important work to do. <laughs> so this working group had been appointed at the last um, advisory board meeting to take a look at the penalty matrix. And I will tell you, I think we worked really well together. Um, and strong evidence of having worked well together is that we agreed on everything except mm -hmm. for one one placement. The penalty matrix that you have in front, well let me go, I have a couple prepared statements, it won't take long, but I think it's good to give an overview of, of how this process worked. As you know, when a uh, licensee engages in a violation, um, our prosecutorial discretion is confined by the enforcement plan, and in the past we've had penalties based on whether it was a first violation, a second violation, a third violation, and then what we had to charge in terms of administrative penalty or a sanction um, was was set forth in the plan, much like sentencing guidelines, which have also come under criticism. Um, our hands were tied as to what we could do without taking into account the nature of the violation. Most specifically, 
Was it just a clumsy error, a ministerial mistake, a good faith but an erroneous interpretation of the law? Or did it reflect connivance, trickery, and an intentional desire to break our laws to make a profit? The enforcement plan, if, or the penalty matrix, if nothing else, reflects a deep-seated belief that compliance with the law should be less expensive than violation of the law because the enforcement penalties seek to deter wrongful behavior. Um, I think I speak for everybody, everybody involved in saying that the process went exceptionally well and the various interests w which were represented, staff and industry representatives, realized that we sought the same outcome which might generally be described as permitting more discretion in the assessment of penalties based on the particular facts of the case so as not to penalize towing and storage companies for careless violations. Uh, oftentimes we're finding people who just um, didn't have working famili familiarity with the rules but desired to come into compliance being penalized at the same level. And as we got into a second violation, I mean the penalties got very high. And third violations were required to revoke in many instances. The new plan, I think, reflects a more mature understanding of the industry and what is needed to balance the right of businesses to operate with as little governmental interference as possible um, in equal value as our citizens' rights not to be subjected to sloppy, predatory, or unscrupulous conduct. Uh, as I said, the greatest evidence of the good working relationship forged in the work group is that all the proposed changes except for one are agreed upon. The majority of the changes shift violations into lower penalty groups. This reflects staff having heard past concerns brought forward by the advisory board that penalties were too high, as well as staff having developed a better sense over the past five years of what is really happening in the field, rather than saying this sounds like a serious violation, let's go ahead and put a high penalty on it, recognizing where the problems took place and what we needed to di um, discourage. Um, many of the violations simp uh, which came to our desk did not cause consumer injury and didn't interfere with the rights of the citizen and so we felt that those could be decreased. In addition, many of the violations that had high penalties, we just didn't see it coming across our desk, which meant they weren't a problem. They didn't need to be dissuaded so that somebody who violated one of those uh, regulations or laws um, was not participating in a larger scheme. Stiff penalties, of course, serve a deterrent purpose but if we're not seeing the problems in the areas, then it indicates those violations are not intentional or they don't cause consumer injury and therefore do not need to have stiff penalties to deter them. What I'd like to do now is go directly into the proposed changes to the enforcement plan. And I'll caution you, at least for me, um, it's really easy to have two sets of two documents, which means four documents with eight <laughs> classifications. And you're going all over and, okay, what, how far down? Um, so what I have in front of me are the drafts that reflect the changes. And I, what's up there that reflects the changes? Okay. The most, in, the, the most significant one is we've gotten rid of first, second, and third penalty. And what we've done is just allowed staff discretion to impose a penalty. So in class A, which is our lowest violation level, you'll see instead of having a first penalty violated or charged at $400, second at between six and eight, and the third at a thousand to twelve hundred dollars, a class A violation is now somewhere between two hundred and eight hundred dollars. And I'll stress again, what this allows us to do in all of these um, in, for, in all of these instances with different classes where we have discretion within a set amount, it allows us to look at the specific facts and circumstances of a violation. And again, was this unintentional, was this sloppiness, was this intentional deception? trying to cause consumer harm. And, and I think that that allows us um, to craft our penalties without the blunderbust hammer that sometimes we take against the small operators. The first change that we see in the tow penalty matrix is under administrative violations where we had taken what had been a class A, and I'm looking at the fourth one down on class A, we had taken what used to be a Class A, failure to notify the Department of a licensee or permit holder's name change no later than the effective date of the change. We moved it to a Class C, which is a relatively high and certainly higher classification of penalty. And the reason for this was because as prosecutors, we need to know who the wrongdoer is. And if any of you have ever scrolled through tools records, as we do all the time, 
trying to ascertain the correct <coughs> name of a business, especially when they're playing shell games with an LLC or a corporation, or they're changing their name every eight months so that we get um, responses back that we've named the wrong company, um, is prevents us from being effective as prosecutors. This is not a difficult thing for companies to comply with, is keeping their name updated, which is already required by statute. We've simply increased the penalty to a Class C. Uh, the next page on page two, what used to be a class B, we've combined with the class A, so the A's and B's are all combined under class A, which again, um, you'll notice significantly shifts the penalty range lower. But this is because everything we see in what used to be class B on two, page two of your documents, uh, we don't see those as, as constituting significant consumer harm and we don't see them coming across our desk as a big problem that needs to be deterred. Oftentimes we see these as paperwork violations or un lack of familiarity with the rules that um, don't need the $1,200 penalty or the $1,800 penalty that could p potentially be assessed for these violations. The next changes you'll see are, are on page three. The tow fee schedule violations. Those used to be a class F. That began at a $2,000 penalty for simply having wrong information on, for instance, the non-consent tow fee schedule um, or failure to provide it to somebody. The um, failed to make a non-consent tow fee schedule available to a request or during nor normal business hours. We don't see these violations happening. You know, we really we don't have a lot of problems with the non-consent tow fee schedules. Uh, we do see, and especially in heavy duty, it seems like. Uh, where people are charging things that are not on the non-consent tow fee schedule, but those are illegal charges. These are just, you know, much like the signs that Ms. Rash was talking about earlier, um, they, they're not intentionally out of date. They don't have fraudulent or fictitious information on them as an attempt to, um, to charge more than might otherwise be allowed. And anyways, people can charge whatever they want on a non-consent tow fee schedule. Um, so we did not see these as constituting significant consumer harm, nor did they come across our desk so frequently that they needed the prophylactic or deterrent effect of large penalties. And so when we shifted all of this down to class A from class F. As you consider the downward shift that we've made in a lot of these penalties, always remember that we, if we have repeat offenders, if we see people who we recognize are using a certain scheme or tactic or embedded business model um, to continually present wrong information on the non-consent tow fee schedule or in other, any of these others, A's and B's that we've moved down significantly, we can go after them under the larger penalties, the deceptive, dishonest, or lack of integrity charges when we see that somebody is purposely using ploys in these arenas to rip off consumers systematically. So it's, it's, we are not giving up on ensuring enforcement of this. <coughs> we just don't think that the penalties that were originally handed down for these fit the crime, you might say. Um, the next one, the first significant change is tow safety, vi tow safety violations. They're on page three. Required boom, winch, or carrier mechanism <coughs> capacity information. We're not, you know, especially without the tow truck <coughs> inspections anymore. Um, I've never had a case in my five years here where the boom, winch, or carry mechanism failed um, and that the failure to have a data plate on the truck or the manufacturer's information in the glove compartment resulted in injury or harm to somebody. What we were seeing was that data plates like had worn out or been painted over. We weren't seeing data plates being transferred from one truck to another, something that was um, a threat. It was more that these things were just wearing out or they'd been scratched and they weren't legible. Um, and we're penalizing people for that. So this is, that's why. And I'm justifying why we're moving all of these. If you have any concern that we've lowered something too low or moved something too high. Um, and really, the, the, the um, members of the group, I apologize for that. Um, Ms. 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 Rash, resources in this and I a lot of discussion for sure. But if you, know, if you have questions, I think it's probably best to come up with even made. We can 
what you see in in B D used to uh, I'm sorry, not good for first violation, twenty one for a third violation. As you can see we've moved the penalties down to five hundred dollars to fifteen dollar maximum. We are uh, well we are permitted to seek suspension or suspension when we have a serious violation. That that's a good tactic to take. The license often much the license monetary penalty. You know, unfortunately, at any business, somebody who wants to go conduct like rational decisions and say, if I do this, I get it for one time. I'm making a profit four times. Or, however, the of a revocation or suspension is uh, a much greater deterrent. So good. That Increasing amount of the penalty will still give us an effective arm, an effective tool in preventing wrongdoing and going after those people who themselves sexual leaders. So once we've gotten rid of the first violation, to give us to look at the circumstance of each case, because every case is different. On page four, you'll see that we the tow fee schedule as B. Which the consolidated in with the consolidated. Um, again, had to do more with paper paper violations. The failure to identify the schedule, these uh, list penalty rates, failure to provide that tow fee schedule. That's no those violations. Reason for somebody when they violate um, to to with the higher penalty that originally plus. So we move of page four, the implementations, and I will say that we just did a dispute on this, the members of the working group and staff, which include um, your staff, leaders, office of general counsel, and their to our team. The improper tow violations were actually they are right violation that begins the two thousand dollar penalty and moves up from there. C and G. Uh, I'm sorry, general count. Um, now the improper violations are supposed to be in class B, um, by members of the work group. The class B starts with a five hundred dollar violation. Goes up to a fifteen hundred dollar violation. As the improper testified, they begin with a two thousand dollar violation. Means that people who risk and wrongful toast will not make a profit from it, and they will pay for it. And I think we're pretty good um, at executing legal toast, but it doesn't happen a lot. I mean, you see that we had what nineteen in the last reporting session. So whereas the of the work group requested that improper tow violations be moved to Class B. Staff still wishes it to remain in Class C, which well, I just had uh, had A. The is in between correct. Not that's what we were. And the was going to present it. A. Okay. okay. Well, so where you wanted it? Is that correct? Well, yes. With um, plan A. A. Being bored is we have a conflict between the property code and our chapter still. We weren't able to to correct that conflict. Uh, property owners' rights under the property code, and of course, there are that's who we're going for. Uh, and there's a in our eight need to resolve that conflict. Uh, if if I may make sure that is, is you well, came up with a, that's what I'm trying right. to say. Michael was a. Point in time. And I'm 
think that we our discussion about, about B, but putting in our putting in R. Correct. Which was way up there. So that was why we wanted to discuss it here at the board today. I mean, just that's just particular in that reasoning behind discussion is okay. this conflict that exists. So just just to make sure the record is accurate, okay. members requesting that the move to class A. Correct. Original. Okay. And now a class A allows for a between two years and eight Correct. Where the improper violations of the present eight class begins with that dollar violation. If we move as staff is recommending to the class C, that's still a reduction in to seek. The class C begins with a one thousand dollar as opposed to a two violation. So staff's recommendation still is a shift downward by fifty percent of what we can seek for the improper violations. Uh, we believe that in order to towing, which is tow and the need to tow quickly, they often tow trailers in a situation where they're called out by an or the director by the tow a car that their tow truck driver is responsible to pull in there to look at the signs. See the effort not just the flat time over. To understand our I think this is what you refer to with the violent the property code to understand the law that uh, towing from an apartment complex can only be done since the legislature has authorized towing from the uh, up and complex. And remember that those rules, laws are our because the because it's been or the against because it's in the line between one parking space and another. Um, though that imposed on us by the legislature, the legislature very clear that you can tow from an apartment complex for six express reasons. That's, that's an all-inclusive list, and that needs to be taken somewhere besides with staff because we have to prosecute. The reason this is an issue is because it's a new interpretation. Prior to a year ago, or whenever we all started, it was not a violation to a double parked in car. And the interpretation that we're fighting for the mass confusion throughout the amongst property owners and towers on what's allowed and what's not allowed now. And the if we put it in A or B, you your honesty and intelligence things that you can yeah. if it, if it, like, they don't care what the law is yeah. that they didn't know, but you start <coughs> other tools to go after them a stiffer penalty. Except it's hard to show the state of mind necessary to prove up honesty, integrity, and trustworthiness when you've got 12 different actors, say 12 different truck drivers, and they're all, um, each one of them may perform one legal tow every two months. It's hard to say that that causes the business just in a lack of honesty and trustworthiness. And this why the tow truck drivers himself um, to be sure in the law. I can't what interpret prior to two years. Mary Winston, TDLR. Joanna had a question. On your the lower in A based on received a new interpretation because mm -hmm. they don't understand. Mm -hmm. So typically, we don't make or a conflict, or, or some people agree with the interpretation. Because Mike is giving the leadership direction we've been sent to go into. Typically, we don't, as an agency, reduce that to the lowest penalty possible. There may be time or time that uh, the penalty may be imposed immediately, maybe a warning to possibly. 
but that's how we create it low on a lag time of understanding of the latency of you know what I'm saying? The it's not just the lag time. But it's a interpretation difference on we feel like the property code allows it uh, and y'all property. So that's where our, and I'd like to hear it's two other board members. That's in conflict. I mean, we know mm. how we, everybody knows how we feel. And yeah. <laughs> maybe the other board members. Trying to find a balance yeah. where we need to be with this conflict. And in due respect, it's, it's not the one every month or every other month. That's not where the big problems lie. It's the guys that are 20 or 30 guys. That's the problem. And then you can get into that, like Joanne, your big stick. If you, like if we moved it to B, you still have six months probated suspension <coughs> up to six months full suspension, <coughs> which would get the big compromise, I think, at this point in time, since we're in this conflict world. We've been in. Besides that, we're not only talking about apartment towing, we're talking about towing for property in so it's right. a big part of the industry and we have this in that we can fix it like we do but you know talk to the director about possibly an attorney general something where that we can get rid of this conflict right now. Board members, deputies. What you're saying, whenever you know, years ago when we were looking at the penalty matrix, we had a large and a large discussion that sent for those that were on the board, the extensive on this. Um, the property code came up at that point in time also, and if I'm not mistaken, and while we understand that you're kind of caught hard play a large responsibility simply to follow statutes that we follow and the property code is not part of what we kind of adhere real rules to it's based on doing statute that we receive statute that we receive and mm -hmm. that goes with what we follow why I, I'm, empathetic, I'm empathetic to the fact that there may be a conflict to what we that is the reason and to take from a type A to a type A uh, or class or class F to a class A, that is a, a drastic change, a drastic. Uh, it would be D move. to A because we're combining. We're not going to have F anymore, right? right? Is that correct? Yeah. Um, we'll go to D. So anyway, that, that is one of the uh, considerations that we have for us because that do, um, and that, that again, you know, we're fortunate that should come in every two years um, and start with it again. It's just uh, while, while I'm the property code is where we're, our statute for towing is the find this based out of. Well, in the conflict interpretation, I was on the original board, Lieutenant Governor Bob Bulk appointed, and we wrote private property regulation. It was never to be that understanding that we property owners that were part of that committee. Then we had this different conflict we've all lived for years. And that's where the conflict is. It's not new to us. The, the interpretation is new to us from the department. We don't agree with that by the department that, that it is just six. Don't. Matter of fact, six original. You didn't sign. That's what it was for. But I, we point and talked about it at, in the in the work group. Would be for you right now. Mm -hmm. Has tools. Enforcement still has tools. If you have these crazy people that were in the house, then you have those tools. You have that proof. You can use that, but for the everyday guy who may tow the one every other month or once 
to my he's he's making it on private property fraud or something like that. The work group is proposing this be placed in B. That would be the compromise, yeah. Okay. Compromise. And as I said, I'd like to hear from other folks in the work group to snap in. <laughs> Jen, <laughs> Jen, let's get this out and do it. I mean, you really feel. On to numerous complaints uh, from citizens regarding their car being towed. And it's everything from management to property and in between. I tell you that the majority of the get property towed and it takes from apartment complexes and for the very reasons that you have said. And to be honest with you, the people that are being the hardest by these improper are the in least afford. They're in apartment complexes that frankly really, really care about them. They just want those those vehicles off the property, and, and so I would be more in favor of not lowering it as much. And probably I, I would I would go with Mr. Shirk's uh, recommendation of, of of C, only because that's the only deterrent to these uh, these bad actors who are out there. Um, because we've had complaints where people will get their cars out and their uh, their their uh, parking permit is still on their windshield. It was just ignored. Or they say, they went into my car and removed it. Uh, and that, that goes uh, beyond the whole issue of them going into cars improperly to uh, lock the transmission and the steering. To, that's a whole separate issue that we have a problem with. And so I can tell you from a law enforcement perspective, I would be more in favor of, of the uh, higher penalty. Madam Nails. Chair, I just want to say that we represent the whole state of Texas, and there are hot pockets of anything that we do, always, and it's nearly always going to be in areas of society. And being a property tower myself, I just got a contract from the Houston Authority for the towing company. I was doing what you're talking. You know, at some point in time, property owners have to be responsible. But I will say that the property owners are trying to manage their property and to the coin. And yes, y'all always hear that, and you are because people are like wholly up. Like you said, no matter why they get towed, your other probably is parking violations down there. <coughs> so I agree with that. There's a tow hearing. There's other remedies. Again, I'm not at all, and Michael, you know, we, I specifically said, tell me what you have. So I don't want to trample your personal factors. We left that, all that act in the So you have that. But for John Doe, Little Tower, which is less than three per company in Texas, let's at least get enforcement some leverage because a thousand dollars is more than note on their tow truck to have towed one you don't have much leverage you bump it all the way up where you are so we're not the board trying to keep you from influence on the people we're trying to make it level for all the towers in texas okay understood Madam okay. Chair, uh, may I yes. address you? I'm Chief Prosecutor. I'm uh, Ron Foster. Just want to share some of my concerns. Um, I think the question is amount, the amount of leverage that we're going to have mm -hmm. in these types of cases that we can um, go after these really, truly bad actors. When you look at the statistics that were provided to you, you can see that more than 90% of the cases in the tow program are being resolved without any penalty or sanction being assessed. So when you look at the list of violations, and the, at the top is, ni is 19 violations regarding illegal type of tows, you're going after the worst actors. That's because my prosecutors are exercising a tremendous amount of discretion on each one of their cases to determine who are the really bad actors and going after those ones that are the bad actors and issuing warning letters or getting people to come into compliance on the other ones. 
So the question is, when you have individual deterrence against a person, what is the penalty going to be to keep that person, that really bad actor, from doing that again? I think the prosecutors need to have a little bit more tools at their disposal, having a higher penalty in order to be successful doing that. And keeping in mind that it's a very small subset of cases that we see. It's not a, a flood of individuals that we're issuing large penalties against for these types of violations. I just want you to understand that the statistics that we've presented to you bear that out. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> Jimmy, do you have anything? Madam Chair, I think it's a great compromise to put in B. Uh, we had a lot of conversations on this. And we were going back and forth. And I just think right now, see how it works. Put it in B. And if there's a problem that arises from that, let's address that at a later date. And also, just everybody keep in mind, we're only making a recommendation <coughs> to the commission. So um, the commission will have the final say on this. So whatever we decide here today is not <coughs> necessarily going to happen because he's going to go talk to the commission as well. And um, they have the final say in it. But we did have a great work group. We did everything was, this was our only bone of contention. Yes. And uh, I would like to see it land and be but I'd also like to see your support on that and your support on that for our reasons um, because as we talked about you still have your honesty integrity if someone's done this four times we know there's an issue uh, but whatever we just need to kind of everybody get their comments out yeah and vote on what we want to do and, and send it up to the Commission for the next step and, and this is not a public comment item right this is a this is not a rule right. this is an internal document okay. here so there's not going to be an opportunity for this to go out to the public for public comment it's just us yeah. and the and commission. Mary Winston TDLR I want to thank Ron for for kind of stepping up there because you all know Michael Ron a little less because he's <laughs> the head honcho yes. but as he said before we're, we're not being punitive the prosecutors uh, are and I'm using Please don't think we think you are. We yeah. don't think that at oh, all. Oh, definitely. We're just watching out for the industry. Mm -hmm. We're yeah. very aware of what's going on in private property towing with the interpretations. We worked hard on it during session. We couldn't get it resolved. So now we're dealing with it. We've got two more years to deal with it. Yeah. So. And thanks one me. other remark, Madam Chair, is we're putting a great amount of faith in you by getting rid of the first, second, and third violation. Because it kind of, for us, was like, okay, this kind of gives you guidance, so to speak. So we're just like laying it out to you. You have this range you get to pick, where before you kind of were tied to first, second, or third. So we are really, really trying to be weighed up that it's fair across the board. And appreciate it, because y'all are here today, but. Some people might be going tomorrow and, and think about it differently than that. Madam thank Chair, you, thank uh, you. Mike Harris Smith, Deputy Executive Director, thank you for your comments. We appreciate that mm -hmm. and, and your understanding that we are trying to do also what we think is best for the industry. Um, and, and you're a absolutely right is that uh, these the penalty measures will go up to the commission and they will make the final decision. Uh, your comments will be forwarded to them. So. If you do have a position, we would highly encourage you to go ahead and lay it out so that we can let the commission know because what will happen is that when we get to the commission meeting and they consider this, we will let them know there was there was a, uh, a work group, which again, thank you for your work in that because if anybody understands, I do, um, and the work that you did. And we will make sure that we let the commissioners know that it was a, um, a deep conversation that you had as a work group came before this advisory board was another topic of conversation and so we'll know that there's a lot of emphasis placed on this uh, so that they can actually kind of weigh everything in here and know that uh, it is something that uh, is uh, you're passionate about in your industry and then they will also hear from the uh, prosecutor from you know our prosecution uh, team as to why they believe it should be in this and the Commission will make the final decision but sure. I don't see any problem in moving it forward in, in, in be if mm -hmm. no one else has a question but we will allow the commissioners to know that this was a topic of conversation very good and and he's exactly right because I've listened yeah. to their meetings and they do 
they get all sides and that's what I love about TDLR you do take your input at all levels so and and the vote that you put forth also will tell us uh, we'll let the commissioners know mm -hmm. okay any comments and then the vote itself so we, okay. would, we would welcome all the comments so anybody that want to comment Amy I just want to reiterate what the other towers on the board have said I mean I think it's a definite compromise bringing it up to B I mean they obviously feel very strongly about a <clears throat> from the work group um, conversations but I think B is a compromise I think that people make mistakes and I think why do we have to be so hard on the very first mistake I mean you guys aren't seeing the the uh, expenses that all these towers are seeing you're not seeing how everything has gone up I mean the insurance is is unbelievable these days and um, anything we can do to help these towers and obviously if they're a repeat offender you're going to get them on later on down the road with the lax honesty trustworthiness and integrity um, they make mistakes and that's when you catch them over and over and over again but I I completely agree with B violation James <clears throat> did you have anything no but I don't believe that 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 all mistakes are chronic you know I don't believe that 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 they're just ongoing and I know that it, you can always get tougher. It's hard to get lighter. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I would think that the first shot should be one that's uh, that's that's very more more reasonable, more uh, uh, industry friendly. And then later on, as a group, we can get a little bit tougher on it. Um, Indeed, we can. But that okay. would be my input. Okay. Tasha, do you have anything? Or? No, I think that okay. placing it as P is a good compromise. Okay. Do we have any a motion? Are we ready for a motion? Do y'all have anything else? What's the motion? Are we at the end or where are we? <laughs> I'll make a motion. <laughs> you make I'll a motion. I'll make a motion that we? Uh, we put it in class Oh, wait, B. wait. We, we need to finish the whole thing, right? Yeah. <laughs> uh, all the other changes. I guess we have a little bit more to go over. That's the only thing we fussed about. I know. <laughs> all the other changes um, we concurred in, staff, yes. and the, <laughs> the task force uh, working group members. Um, and so. I just wanted to wrap up by saying that this was a phenomenally good set of meetings. Um, I've been in other work group meetings where there, um, much less was accomplished over a much greater period of time, and I'm looking forward to our, our relationship into the future. Thank you. I want to thank your whole team that worked on it. And um, we still have VSF, right? Yes. <laughs> so don't that's, go. That's but shall we vote on toe oh, now? Gosh. Well, because VSF also was all in concurrence, unless in the readings of these materials okay. that you might have done before the meeting, there are questions or concerns, I'm happy to address them right now. Does anybody have any questions or concerns, comments on the VSF matrix? No. We pretty much agreed on that, so. Madam Chair, okay. I have one other thing. Okay. I'm sorry. This is a lot of work. <laughs> I went back and looked at the amount of penalties that <clears throat> the industry has paid over back to uh, actually 2016 and there are less than 6,000 tow and VSF companies and if we look at that in 2016 we paid 20 percent of all the penalties and y'all have heard me talk about this before I usually always bring it up 20 percent of of all of the businesses y'all regulate and we're only 6,000, you know, so. And then uh, in 2017, we paid 23.4%. In 18, we paid 20.5%. And then in, in for the year of 18, we, it dropped down to 16.8%, which I'm sure is because of Harvey and the, those issues. And then the good news is in 2019, it's, 16.7%. So I'll really be looking because we're back up to paying over $2 million, the industry, for just less than 6,000 businesses who are micro businesses in Texas. So I'm hoping that all the work with you, Michael, on the penalty matrix that will get to where we need to be for you to get the bad actors mm -hmm. and for those that are just maybe doing something in a hurry or got a new employee, whatever. I think y'all are doing a phenomenal job in moving in the right direction. I just wanted to tell you that and I appreciate it. Thank you, Ms. Ryan. Okay. Okay, are we ready for a motion? <clears throat> we have a motion to accept it with that one change to B. Yes. 
Yes, that's my motion. <laughs> Is there a second? I would definitely second. Can, I'm okay. sorry. So we need to be really clear on the record as to what we're doing. Can you please make the, the motion again? I make a motion. We approve the rules with the changes except moving the improper, tow improper towing to Class B and approving VSF as it is. Second. Thank you. Do I have a second? I concur. Jimmy? Yes. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 All those opposed? <coughs> nay, but only for the reasons that I, I okay. mentioned before. Okay. So we have one nay. Okay. Thank you, board. I appreciate the good discussion. Thank you, Michael, again. And um, now we're ready to talk about recommendation for our next board meeting and when do we have to meet do we need to come back for public comment on this we uh, do increase um, this madam, huge yeah, increase madam chair got? right now what we're looking at is uh, the week of September the 23rd of having a meeting um, and we're probably looking at Monday the 23rd or Friday the 27th those are those are the days that we do have open for an advisory board meeting That gets us right before a commission that. meeting. So, so Monday or Friday? October. So Monday the 23rd or Friday the 27th of September. Any preferences? I like Monday, but Monday. Monday is good. Okay. Monday the 23rd. Let's do the 23rd. We'll go ahead and schedule it for that day. And the agenda items will have the um, VSF rules that we talked about today. Correct. We'll have the rules come back before you. What else do we have? Is that all we have going on that we If need? you wanted to take up any other issue that was brought up in public comment or if you have any other the issues forum? that you'd like to take up on the next agenda. We want to bring the forum up. Sorry? I think that's what she's referring to. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Again. Okay, and if y'all have any other items between now and then, let me know. We'll add them to the agenda. But other than that, I think, do I have a motion to adjourn? I'll, I'll make a motion. I'll <laughs> second the motion. Okay. Right. We're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.